So um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panel today. We are pleased to be joined by Torkil Tanhoy, who is a professor of games and learning at Orberg University, Copenhagen, where he also coordinates the Center for Applied Game Research. His work explores teaching with games, especially dialogic aspects and possibilities for developing literacies. Joining us from Generation Global, Lisa Petro is the Education and Quality Lead at Generation Global, the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, focusing on curricula and interventions to foster intercultural communication and open-minded global citizens. She is co-founder of Know My World and a consultant for Tecnologico de Monterrey in Mexico. Lisa is joined today by Lorenzo Raffio, her colleague at Generation Global, who leads the development of large-scale digital learning platforms, monitoring and evaluating the impact of educational activities designed for young people. And finally, we welcome Marianne Pickles. Marianne believes in the power of video games for learning languages, having worked to develop an immersive game in Minecraft. As the Head of Assessment Development at Cambridge University Press and Assessment, she leads an English language acquisition team on products focused on digital innovation. With that, um, we're going to start with our three brief presentations and I will ask uh, Torquil to start his presentation. Torquil, do you, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hope that you can see my screen now. We can. Great, okay. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, I will be talking briefly about games as spaces for dialogue and expertise. And um, these slides will be passed around. So I just put up some links here. You might be interested in checking out because I've been doing research in this field for 15 years um, and covering very different games, very different aspects, angles on, on how to use games, mostly in primary and secondary education, um, mostly in Denmark, but also in other countries. Um, yeah. So that's a lot of stories to tell, but I can't go into all of them here. So <laughs> you might want to check some of this out if you're interested. Okay, so I have been asked by the organizers to kind of start this seminar by setting the stage as Barry uh, asked me to do. And I have very brief time, but what I will try to do is to argue that um, in many ways, the use of digital games in formal education has been kind of oversold as a learning resource, as there is, there's been a huge tendency to view games as generic tools suited for more or less any kind of educational purpose we could come up with. So what I really want to argue is that we should be way more specific about uh, when we talk about games and education. And to start with, we should at least distinguish between these four forms or types uh, of games education, which is gamification, students learning by designing games, when working with commercial games, or uh, when we are working with games specifically designed for learning. So that, that, that's a starting point, but I mean, that's nowhere near enough. We need to be way more specific because games are always situated in very specific learning contexts. So as far as I see, the question is not so much, is it a good idea to use games education? It's much more a question of how are we going to do it? How are educators going to actually employ them in, in the classroom? How are we going to deliver uh, to develop games that can be used for specific educational purposes? Uh, so we need to go into the game mechanics, the dynamics, the aesthetics, look at the specific game challenges, how they link meaningful to pedagogical curricular aims. What is the role of the teacher in facilitating games and setting all this up, making it work, all the practical aspects that researchers tend to forget all about when they're writing up the research, but actually took up a lot of time and space when they had to make things work with the firewall and installing the games on the computers, etc. Um, so we need to go much more into the detail and we need to accept that games are, it's a multi-headed monster and it many different phases and it's actually a many, lot of very different things. So going from there, I want to argue that um, put up some big claims because the, this, the bombastic title of this uh, webinar is the future of gaming and education. So I think we should acknowledge that our games have limited educational value when used for learning facts or basic skills. And I'm not just saying this as a polemic statement. I've actually been through the literature. When you look at the research into using 
uh, games for learning math, basic math, or games for learning reading. Um, actually, very weak uh, results overall. Um, so, so this is not very effective for that. You can you can compare that with the using games for learning English as a foreign language. There are very impressive evidence and results that this is actually a very good idea. Young children learn a lot of English just by playing games outside school. They can bring that into school. We see that a lot here in Denmark. Um, then I want to argue that games have a strong potential for creating these kind of shared dialectic spaces where learners can communicate, create knowledge, explore different perspectives. They are social environments. We need to accept that. We need to acknowledge that. We, as educators, we need to understand that. And we need to look into how we develop, use expertise when we are trying to overcome challenges when we're playing this game, when the students are doing that. And they will have different preferences, different motivations, and we need to accept that. So there's no magic silver bullet here. It, it's, it's, again, it's very complex. It, it, it's very varied field. Um, and then we're looking into how the teacher is actually going to identify, select games, and naming and framing those for specific aims in education. Um, and I really want to show a very bad example because we always tend to talk about good example when we're doing research in this topic. So this is a, um, an example I found on the internet. This is taking Minecraft into the, cl the math classroom. And the question number nine is, what is one fourth of 12? And as you might guess or can see, there's not really that much point in using Minecraft for teaching math in this way. This question would just have been in the textbook. There's no reason why we should use Minecraft for teaching this question, because this question does not in any way tie with the mechanics or the challenges of the game. It's just um, a and, and decontextualized math question. So then you, you might wonder, what should we do then? Well, I would argue that we really need to look at these game challenges. So what is difficult when you're playing Minecraft, that is actually navigating, finding your way, not getting lost, finding your friends, finding your house, finding your treasures, finding where you're going to mine your stuff you're going to need for building resources in the game. So you need to look into, as a teacher, you need to look at the game challenges, find out how they're linked to the game goals, find out how they're linked to the curriculum, and find out how the game works and how students are actually going to play that in the classroom. And just to give you an example of how you can actually use Minecraft for learning math, I want to take up this example where students are actually learning about the coordinate system, which is a part of Minecraft because you can just click a button and you can get the X, Y, and Z coordinates, and then you know where you are in this 3D uh, world. So you can actually use mathematical knowledge for teaching students how to navigate the game. They can get advances in the game. They can find their things. They can create challenges for each other, and they are actually learning math in doing so. So we started this and, and came up with very good findings on this stuff. So that's a very strong link with this example between learning math and learning to be better within the game, which is tied up with navigation in the game, which is actually a challenge for, especially for young players. So this was a good example and a bad example of how to link games and education. Um, and again, going back to this model, um, I tried to fill out blanks here. I won't go into the detail of all this. I uh, hope it was more or less clear what I just said. Um, yes. So, so the point is, how can we turn game challenges into meaningful educational challenges? And of course, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one overlap or direct link between games. It may be very difficult to link Counter-Strike to math teaching, for instance. Uh, so, and, and it looks different, different subjects, how we actually link in games to, to, uh, to specific subjects. Um, and then I also wanted to, to, process, to present um, a snapshot from a, another project I've completed here um, in Denmark, which is about using this game, which is a co-op uh, action role-playing game called Torchlight 2. Some of you are familiar with Diablo and know this genre of games. And, and what was interesting about this project was we are trying to include children in the classroom who are normally marginalized by setting them up in groups where they're playing against the computer. So it's a co-op game. They have to coordinate, collaborate, communicate. They have to, and they have, we, we uh, 
as educators, we forced the students to play the, the game at the highest level of difficulty, which meant that if they were not collaborating, they would just die constantly in the game. So when you're forced to collaborate, you learn a lot about how you are dependent on each other, and then it would build up a curricular task and aims around that, those um, kind of inclusive game-based learning environment we're creating here. So that's another example of how the sociality of gaming, the socialization of gaming is actually very important when you talk. And this tends to be overlooked in the research, surprisingly. Um, and finally, I want to bring attention to this example, which is something I'm working on now, which is uh, going along the same lines, which is about looking into how we can, how educators actually already now in Denmark using e-sport activities, gaming activities to help young adults with autism to develop language communication to relate to each other and uh, to also in continuation of this to develop digital skills around video production programming uh esport uh careers maybe even and and uh, so so what i really want to stress today is that we need to look into this um to um, Multiplayer games as social arenas, dialogic arenas, where you are able to communicate in, in different ways. You're sort of forced into solving challenges together and you need to communicate, you need to collaborate. And in interesting learning opportunities can arise from that. So that was my final words. I hope this will open up for some interesting discussions later on. And I will stop here. So thank you for your attention. Um, I am very excited to be here with you all today to talk about developing global citizens through gamified dialogic practices. <laughs> and um, as you know, my name is Lisa Petro. I am the education and quality lead at Generation Global. We are an education program with the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. And our main focus is to really enable young people ages 13 to 17 to embrace the future, to support them with the kinds of knowledge skills and attitudes that they need to become active, open-minded global citizens. Um, we do this primarily through skills building activities and opportunities for intercultural dialogue. We've worked with uh, more than 570,000 young people since 2009, and we have a goal to reach 100,000 more young people by 2024. So um, definitely looking to expand that reach and access uh, to dialogue. So in 2020, we really started to think about, you know, what do young people need um, in terms of, of, of gaining that access and that reach? And we were in a, a very tumultuous time with COVID and we quickly realized that young people needed a platform that increased their agency, that increased their voice, that it allowed them to access each other in a meaningful way. Um, and our goal then became to really increase this accessibility and reach through a dialogic platform where young people could engage directly with each other and really learn how to be socially aware and responsible for how they communicate. So not just the act of communicating, but really understanding how to communicate. We decided we'd create the ultimate dialogue adventure. Um, and this would be a self-directed gamified pathway for young people to really learn and practice the skills of dialogue and to do that through the lens of today's most pressing issues. So first, we really just wanted to make sure we were clear about the aims of the adventure, the learning architecture, what were we really trying to deliver on? As I mentioned, we identified we wanted a self-guided pathway, a place where young people could learn the definitions of dialogue, why it was important, of course, the core skills and those kinds of attitudes required for having these safe and brave online spaces. We also wanted to offer them those safe and online safe online spaces where they could practice those skills and attitudes with their global peers in asynchronous and synchronous ways. And then lastly, ensure that we provided them with fundamental knowledge about these global topics. So they were not only speaking experientially, but also from an informed place. 
We had already had a research driven dialogic curriculum for youth and educators. So we decided we'd simplify the main tenets of that program, our five core skills, and then the activities that we offered for dialogic opportunity. And we transformed that into this online experience. That gamification element was really put in place to support the student engagement and the ownership, really allowing them to be in control of their pathway. And then educators could support them as guides, but it wasn't necessarily required for the day-to-day -day process. Just a little bit of quick background. We did do quite a bit of research, worked with consultants and just looking at how we were gonna develop this. And three key areas that we looked at amongst many. First, we looked at the International Society for Technology and Education student standards to ensure we were really navigating that, that learning outcome uh, with digital literacy. So empowering learners, um, supporting people in becoming digital citizens. Very importantly, supporting them in learning how to be constructors of their own knowledge, so create knowledge, and then of course, how to collabor collaborate globally um, online. We thought about students potentially in a self-directed way being out of school and looked at the Education Endowment Foundation's home learning approaches planning framework so that we could really hone in on the metacognitive strategies that we felt students would need to make the most of that learning experience. And then lastly, we also thought about technology and access when we were building the platform. So we, we looked at the World Wide Web Consortium um, for the principles of accessibility. So making sure that the technology and the platform was perceivable, it was operable, it was understandable, and it was robust. So just quickly what that game is and how that journey looks. So a student enters the ultimate dialogue adventure and they go into the learning dojo where there are three short modules that just give them the basics of the core skills of dialogue and the, the fundamental attitudes needed to participate in the game. When they complete these learning modules, they are able, they earn a badge and then they unlock the next level. So in this case, they unlock topics. These are also short modules uh, based on 12 contemporary issues that we have um, offered to them where they can do just quick learning, get some information about that, that particular issue. Again, when they complete that, they'd get a badge and then that would unlock dialogue spaces. And these are the asynchronous written spaces that they can participate in with peers from all over the world. We have young people from over 30 countries in these spaces. Um, once they earn a certain amount of points in those dialogue spaces, then they unlock the ability to um, access a, a video conference schedule and book themselves into a live video conference on that topic with global peers. So I mentioned they're adding points. So what we've done is we've derived specific actions from those five core skills that I mentioned earlier. And each of those actions are tied to a certain amount of XP. These XP accrue over time experience. And as they gain more points, then they earn titles. And each of these titles are fun characters and they are directly linked to I can statements in our developmental rubric for dialogic skills. And students have access to this. So they know as they're earning points, how they're developing the skills of dialogue. This is all done through application. So again, when they're in those written dialogic spaces, so for example, if I'm a student and I go into a topic about uh, wealth and poverty, you can see here, I have my title in the corner, um, um, Amoeba is our beginning title. And then I, I see a dialogue and I wanna, I wanna participate, I wanna contribute. So I have to think, here's where the metacognition really comes in. I have to think about how do I wanna contribute to this? What do I wanna say? And I choose from those key actions what I want to do. I want to ask a good question. I want to challenge someone's perspective. I earn points every time I apply those different skills. As they earn points, again, they can unlock those video conferences and they can continue to earn points for completing video conferences and various um, other uh, interventions that we have. So just a little bit about the impact and how we really measure this experience and we look at the, the effect of the game. Um, so when students are participating in the Ultimate Dialogue Adventure, we have a couple of different angles that we look at. We have a psychometric baseline for skills and attitudes that are built into our introductory section, the Learning Dojo. 
it acts as an activity. So it really minimizes the student's experience of, of these kind of long question and answer type assessments. As students go throughout the game and they earn different points, these points can trigger progress trackers that come up really quick, short questionnaires that really um, alternate between their skills and the skills and attitudinal questions. So we get a, a well-rounded view of their growth as they go through the journey. Whoops. Um, we also have a repeated measure survey that takes place. It's released um, when they complete a video conference. So these kind of repeated measure surveys give us a qualitative and quantitative snapshot on the student's journey. Um, the UDA is really designed to be relational in that way. So learners can participate as often as they desire. They can repeat that learning path, that journey. And so we have this kind of concentric way of of collecting data over time, depending on how often they decide to go through that journey. So here, for example, you can see in that repeated measure, we're asking students to self-assess their skills development. How have they applied their skills? Where have they applied their skills in those dialogic um, opportunities? We've, no we've noticed over time with an increase in repeated practice. So students who come back and do more topics, different topics and participate repeatedly in those dialogic opportunities that we do see an increase in attitude. So in this case, warmth towards diversity. The more video conferences they do, the higher that becomes. And so we triangulate that data by comparing quantitative responses with our psychometric surveys, qualitative responses from um, our post video conference surveys, and then samples from the dialogue spaces. I'm gonna pause there because I know that I'm at time, but I also have my colleague, uh, Lorenzo Raffio with us in the audience. So hopefully if you have any deeper questions about data or the build or the learning architecture, Lorenzo and I can address those for you. Thanks so much. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm Marianne Pickles, and today I'm going to tell you about Adventures in English with Cambridge, which is our award-winning educational game built in Minecraft for helping beginner and elementary level English language learners to develop and practice their language skills. In this session, I'm going to tell you about what the game is, I'll explain some of the, des the design principles um, we applied when making the game. I'll say a little bit about the role of user testing and pilots, and then I'll mention some future directions. So Adventures in English is a story-driven adventure game built in Minecraft and available for both Minecraft Education Edition and Bedrock. We designed the game to be suitable for ages 8 to 11 primarily, but we've seen it used successfully with 15 year olds in Japan, and there's no reason that adult learners couldn't use it. So let's watch a two minute video, which gives you an overview, because I'd like you to see um, what the game is about. Learning a foreign language isn't just about studying grammar and memorizing new words. More than anything, it's about our ability to communicate and interact with others. Yet many young language learners around the world don't have an opportunity to practice their skills in a real life-like environment. It's terrible! Adventures in English with Cambridge solves this problem by immersing young learners in a Minecraft world full of exciting opportunities to communicate and solve puzzles using English. Go and look around. Harnessing the hugely popular and engaging world of Minecraft for language learning results in authentic, narrative-driven language practice, which engages imagination, curiosity, and episodic memory. It works by seamlessly integrating world-class teaching approaches with immersive gameplay. We have been careful not to replicate standard classroom activities in a virtual space, nor to lean heavily into pure gameplay. Instead, the adventure is interwoven with opportunities to practice English in a multitude of ways. Every communicative opportunity is joined up to form an engaging and memorable narrative. The learner is placed at the heart of the main events and is motivated to explore, discover, fail, try again and complete the story. It's carefully written around the language curriculum for young learners and fully integrates it into the game. We've had a wonderful response from learners and teachers. Since the Global Pilot released in May 2021, we reached 100,000 learners in just four weeks. Adventures in English with Cambridge has been played by 175,000 users to date, with over 300,000 learners returning to play again. Teachers report higher participation rates and new positive behaviours as the learners actively collaborate and communicate with each other in English. 
Integrating English language immersion with the engaging world of Minecraft makes perfect sense to us, and we're delighted to see that our learners and their educators see it the same way. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what the game is like. In terms of the language in the game, we graded it to level A1 of the Common European Framework, and there's a bit of stretch in places into A2, so beginner and elementary levels. As you've just seen in the video, the gameplay allows learners to practice reading, listening and spelling, and we've supplemented the gameplay with classroom materials which cover speaking and writing. Altogether, the pilot represents about five hours of learning material. We've also created a bank of resources to help teachers make the most of the game. This includes full lesson plans with examples of warm up and extension activities, a visual walkthrough and videos taking teachers step by step through each gameplay level and calling out key language, and worksheets that can be completed during or after the gameplay. And then in terms of delivering the lessons, we wanted to support as much flexibility as possible, so the lessons can be run in a number of ways. Students can play at home or in class. For example, students can play the game first, then come to class and do follow up activities, or they can do the activities in class and then set the gameplay as homework. Alternatively, the game can be played in the classroom. With enough devices, each student can have one. Or the students can play in pairs or small groups, which facilitates discussion and collaboration. If only one device is available, students can take it in turns to control the game while their classmates give them instructions. So I hope that gives you an overview of what the game is. Now let's turn our attention to the design principles we applied when making the game. So my role on Adventures in English centers around the content, and in particular, ensuring that the gameplay and learning are integrated, by which I mean ensuring that the gameplay activities and the learning activities are one and the same. This concept is actually so important to the team that we consider it our principal design principle. So why would this concept be so important? Well, there's a quotation that I really like from Celia Hodent, the game UX consultant who worked on Fortnite. She says that when it comes to games designed specifically for learning, so this was Torquil's category number four, um, we often face the same issue. Either these games aren't truly educational or they aren't fun or both. And this is exactly what we wanted to avoid when we set out to create a games-based learning experience. From an educational perspective, the main objective for people who are learning English is learning how to use the language in communicative contexts. From a gaming perspective, the main objective for people who are playing a game is for the gameplay to feel satisfying and engaging. So how could we do both? We knew it wouldn't work just to shoehorn traditional classroom activities into a Minecraft setting. So what we needed to do was some cross-referencing. We went back to our research-based approach to language learning and considered what helps people learn English. At the same time, we reviewed the video game landscape. There are lots of different ways a game can feel satisfying and engaging because there's such a variety of games and genres. Some video game affordances mapped across particularly well to a language learning context, while others were less relevant. We identified several sweet spots where language learning and games complemented each other. So first there was context. We know that learning grammar or vocabulary or developing language skills happens most effectively when the language is encountered within a meaningful context. A game like Minecraft offers a context rich environment in which we've created a strong narrative so that everything the learner does has an in-game rationale. It's also important that language learning experiences should be relatable to real life. They should be cognitively authentic, and we've designed our puzzles and activities with that in mind. Some of them aren't situationally authentic. For example, you would probably never in real life have to walk over the right series of letters to avoid falling to your doom, unless you're Indiana Jones. But children do have to learn how to spell words in real life. The level of challenge should also be appropriate to the learner's level. 
This comes back to Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, but essentially it means that ideally learners will be presented with challenges which are just a little bit beyond what they can do already. If it's too easy, it's boring and there's nothing to learn. If it's too hard, it's demoralizing and you give up. As James G, the linguist and video games researcher points out, Games, by their nature, deal with this concept brilliantly, taking players through introductory versions of the mechanics at the start, and then gradually asking players to perform at what he calls the outer edge of their ability. Learners also need to develop, develop a willingness to try and fail and try again. Mistakes are vital learning opportunities when it comes to learning a language. Games are wonderful in this capacity because they give players the safe space to fail and try again, which in turn builds persistence. Lastly, exposure to the language, having the opportunity to be immersed in it is extremely valuable. The accessibility of content via the internet means people no longer need to live abroad or attend bilingual schools to have immersive language learning experiences. However, the language content within first language commercial video games is often likely to be extremely challenging for low level learners. With Adventures in English, we provide immersive exposure to the language at an appropriate level of complexity to support beginners and elementary level students. So those are some of the principles which underpin the design of the game. I wanted to mention that we consider user testing during development to be extremely valuable because you can learn an incredible amount in just five minutes of watching a child interact with the game. We've also carried out post-launch trials in Japan and Tur Turkey with over 500 students from primary, junior high and senior high schools. What we learned is feeding back into future content releases. In terms of future directions, we're currently in the process of creating episode two, the next batch of content. And we're also looking at ways of getting better data out of the game so that we can analyze player behavior and better understand the impact of the game on their learning. We'd also love to run more pilots with schools around the world. So please get in touch if you know of any schools that might be interested. Before I finish, I'd just like to take the opportunity to recognize my teammates. We all worked together on episode one, and Adventures in English is really a labor of love. Without the efforts of the whole team, it wouldn't have been possible. So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marianne. Again, a, um, a fascinating talk, and please do um, add your questions to the Q&A if you have um, any specific questions for Marianne. And with that, um, we're going to move to the Q&A element section of this webinar. Um, and I will start to um, pick up some of your questions and address them to the, um, to the team. Um, and there's one actually quite interesting one that I noticed in the chat, which we might have a look at. Um, someone was wondering whether or not there are um, games which are free that can be used in schools. Um, so I don't know if that's um, perhaps a question that um, uh, we'll start with um, Torquild, if you, you might be able to answer that question. Yes. Yes, there's something called the uh, Games for Change. Um, I can just put it up there. Hang on. Uh, where there's a lot of uh, free resources for um, free educational games. And I, I think a lot of them have a pretty high quality. Um, uh, less based on drill and skill exercises, as I was uh, <laughs> talking about before. So, but that, that's at least one example. That's also uh, the Center for Games and Impact uh, in uh, Arizona. I can put that one out as well. Uh, so that's that's at least a lot of free resources for tapping into um, mostly commercial games and I'm relating commercial games to educational aims, but also as a parent, how you could talk about those games at home and what kind of learning come out, more informal learning come, could come out of that. Uh, so those were two examples. And there has been a lot of initiatives trying to 
create these resources. I also created one myself, but it is in Danish. <laughs> I will I will share it here, nevertheless. Uh, so, but what we really need is some some kind of uh, international uh, forum for this, some kind of steam for education. Or, uh, I think that that would be very helpful because that's actually one of the major problems that educators face. Is where should we look? You know, for games to use. Uh, it's very diverse this field. Yeah, absolutely. Well, those those are very helpful. Thank you. I'm sure everyone will be very pleased if they haven't come across across those resources. I don't know, Marianne and or Lisa, if you um, obviously you've been working on designing specific games, but if there are any free resources that either of you have come across in your design work that you might be able to recommend. Um. Well, in relation to Adventures in English, um, we did run a free pilot um, for the first few uh, months of its launch. And if there were particular schools who were keen to use it, then, you know, please get in touch. If funding is an issue for you, we could um, look into um, creating some free accounts for a pilot. Um, so I know that that's not, um, it's just, one example of something, but perhaps it helps a little. Great, thank you. And Lisa? Yeah, I might just add, I mean, in terms of um, places to locate free games, um, I don't necessarily have a resource to recommend. I can say that the Ultimate Dialogue Adventure, our resource is free. Um, so if schools, secondary schools are interested in integrating dialogue into their learning communities, um, this is certainly a way that we can support them at no cost. So um, we encourage them to go to our website, adventure.generation.global, and everything is there. Great, thank you. Well, we move on to another question. Um, and we have a question here from um, Milka, I think, uh, Soto Castillo. Um, and the question is, um, is this terminology um, that we're, we're using today different from what gamification means? And so that can be quite an interesting question because um, there's some debate about the meaning of gamification in relation to games. Um, so again, perhaps Torkild, if you'd like to, like to start with that one. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of confusion about this term gamification. And, and in, in my opinion, it, it makes sense the most when you talk about it as a, uh, when you're using a um, game element in a non-game context. I think that's the definition offered by Sebastian Besserding and the most commonly referenced definition out there. Uh, so that means you can take a specific game mechanic like badges, achievements, points, uh, skill trees, whatever, and you can use that in another setting. Maybe you put it on a classroom wall or whatever you want to do. Uh, and it's not a game, but you're using a game element, so it's gameful. It's it's kind it's gameish. <laughs> uh, but um, I know there's a lot of people that are using the term gamification to mean anything that has to do with games at all uh, in terms of learning. And I think that is very confusing. And uh, that is actually going complete opposite. What I was, I was trying to say is that we need to be more specific. So I think we should restrain the term gamification for these kind of more use of game elements in non-game context. So and the most obvious example of that uh, is probably Kahoot. So Kahoot is the most widely used gamification resource in the world. Um, so so that's my take on that. Thank you. Thank you, Torkild. Um, Lisa, would you like to, like to uh, talk about the distinction um, in the work that you were doing? Yeah, I think what Torkild mentioned, I, I, I was kind of agreeing with that. I think in our case in particular, we had already content, right? We had a curriculum and we wanted to find a way to engage young people. And so that's where the act of gamifying that content kind of came in. How can we take this content and turn it into a process in which students can, uh, you know, again, unlock different levels and, and feel that they've you know, mastered certain achievements while they're developing um, certain skills and how can they do that in a collaborative way. So I think we also had to think a little bit about traditionally games are thought in contexts of competition, 
but ours, you know, our, our experience is one that by nature is far more collaborative. And so I think that's another element um, of that. I would add to that. Great. Thank you. And, and Marianne, is there, would you like to? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree. Um, the definition that Torquil gave is also the one that um, I'm familiar with and I think is most helpful. Um, although, yeah, it, we're trying to avoid using the term because it's so confusing. Um, but for example, I think if the core activity that you're trying to do is, is something that isn't a game at all. So if you're trying to learn how to play a musical instrument and you're using an app that helps um, you know, encourages you with streaks and things like that. Or if you're trying to do more exercise, those kinds of things um, are gamification. There's quite an interesting strand in the research about gamification because there are a few papers. Um, I'd have to look up the references afterwards, but they talk about the dark triumvirate. Um, and that refers to points, leaderboards and badges because um, in a lot of cases, um, people who want to gamify something, um, they think, okay, well, if I put some points on it or if I make it have badges or if I give it a leaderboard, that'll be engaging, won't it? But, it, not, but not necessarily because um, what you might just be doing is trying to add an inappropriate kind of extrinsic motivation onto something where it doesn't belong. So really what you've got to do is go back to what is it that you're trying to achieve and look for um, whatever the kind of core appropriate drives that you want to tap into and, and design from there. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pick up now though um, on several sort of quite similar questions, I think. Um, so we have a question uh, from Stuart Edwards um, asking about applications for technical and vocational education. Um, and then there are two separate questions, um, I think one from uh, Lisa and uh, one from uh, Mark asking um, about game-based learning for entrepreneurship or business studies um, or, or business simulator games in high school. So, so those sort of, um, perhaps again, if we start, start with you, Torquilt, if, if you've come across anything in that particular area. Well, again, I'm, it's, it's the language issue again, because um, I have just been an advisor on a project uh, where um, educators in, in the college, um, what's it called, community colleges, business colleges, develop their own games for their own teaching. And I have never been in a project where there's so much ownership and so much interest and enthusiasm among project teachers. So they simply develop their own teaching resources for entrepreneurship teaching and uh, so I gave them inspiration I gave them ideas but they put they put them all together themselves most of these examples are analog board game design some are digital uh, as well I put in a link here there are 16 examples they're in Danish I'm sorry <laughs> but, but, the, but I think what is what is the takeaway here is that there's often a small market for developing these kind of games for these specific educations and, and uh, often it may be a bad idea to think about how can educators actually develop their own games for teaching. And, you know, they can co-learn with their colleagues how to develop them and give them to others. And they don't have to be very complex games. It has to be, it could be, fairly, be fairly simple games. Um, so that was actually my takeaway from that project, that, that sometimes it's actually a better idea to make, have educators develop their own games than trying to look for something that is expensive and fits a very narrow, narrow curricular topic. Thank you. Um, obviously, Marianne and Lisa, you were, your talk was on specific games, so I don't know if you want to add anything to, to this question. Um, Marianne? I don't think I have anything to add, sorry. No, that's, that's fine. Lisa, no? No, I'm not familiar not with familiar. any games for entrepreneurship, thank you. Sure. Um, so I now have a question, I think, for um, Marianne. Um, uh, I've used Minecraft uh, Learn English for Cambridge as, as a trial, and they were wondering if it's possible for students to play in multiplayer mode. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's something that we'd like to do in the future. Um, it's not something that we're able to do at the moment. Um, 
I mean, I think if you tried, if you enabled cheats and you tried, it would probably break stuff. Um, but so the closest you can get at the moment is having students play in pairs or small groups. Um, we found that worked really well, actually, because there's a there's a worksheet that's like a ripped page from within the world of the game and they can they can complete it while they're playing. And um, it's quite nice for them to help each other with that. Um, but uh, yes, multiplayer. Um, there's always there's always the safeguarding issue, like if we wanted to make it available on the commercial version. Um, so it's something that that's that's something that we've always been a bit nervous about. In a classroom setting, it's obviously brilliant. Um, so yeah, I, hopefully sometime in the not too distant future, it's something we'll be able to do. Great, thank you. Um, and I have, uh, there are two questions here, one about um, games for secondary maths and another about games-based learning in STEM education. But I think there's a really interesting follow-up uh, question there on the second one, which is how can we educate pre-service teachers in the use of games-based learning? So I think it would be interesting to take that question and think about how teachers um, obviously, for, for some, that's that may be a new a new thing to think about. So, how can we we help um, teachers? So, so who would anyone like to start with that that particular question? Um, shall we go to again, Torquil? Do you want to start? <laughs> okay, I, I can uh, give an yeah. answer. Um, I think it's it's very important to recognise that games are different and teachers have very different game literacies and game preferences so we should not expect that using Minecraft is for every language teacher perhaps um, it, I would say it's, it's may maybe too complex for everyone uh, but it's definitely a game that can appeal to a lot of language teachers I would say so I think we, we need to of course, look into what are the curricular aims, how can the game fit that particular aim, or we might start the other way around, look at Minecraft, how can we fit curricular content in relation to, to the game. But there's an important discussion about the complexity of the game and how much it actually fits with the teacher's way of teaching, how much the knowledge the teacher has about games. And we, we really need to, to acknowledge that there's, a, you know, that different, competences, game competence for, for the, in terms of te teachers and not just talk about teachers as just like one thing. Um, so we need to be much more differentiated and in that. Um, so the eSport example I was mentioning, we're using eSport for young adults with autism. It's highly specialized teaching. You really need to know what you're doing with Counter-Strike and League of Legends. You really need to know both in terms of the game and in terms of the pedagogy when you work on this in special education. So these are very specialized people I'm working with here in this project. So on the other hand, you might, you might find very simple tools like Kahoot, which is anyone can, I would say, use that. So, so I think we need to look at maybe different skill levels. I don't, don't know, I'm sure it's a technos, taxonomy, but yeah, that, it's the kind of discussion we need to have, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and maybe Lisa, what, what's been your experience of engaging with people other than the players, so adults and teachers around those players? Yeah, thanks. No, this is a this is a wonderful area to to talk about, and I I personally think there's quite a lot to to learn, um, and I think obviously with the the increased demand in online learning and gamification post pandemic, we've really had to come up against these kinds of questions and this expectation that. Everyone, you know, it, not everyone is entering in at the same skill level as Torquil mentioned, right? And so there's a learning curve there. Um, in, in our experience, I think we found that simplicity is key for educators. That's that's a very important thing. That the 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 more simplicity in the game and the way that 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 game is is sort of used is really important. Um, that it's accessible and understanding, not just across different levels of understanding and technology and digital literacy, but also, you know, cultural contexts and pedagogy and language. There's a lot of considerations to take in 
into in, into account. Um, and I think in terms of, of of working with teachers, it's really accepting and understanding the diverse instructional strategies that teachers use, and ensuring that you are aligned with those strategies, and that teachers that that what whatever you produce is not, you know, it's it's transferable it's adaptable. It can meet teachers where they're at in a lot of different places. And I think that that's a really important element to, to gamified learning. Thank you. Um, and Marianne, do you have um, any insights in how you work with teachers that you could share? Um, I mean, it's definitely a, a question that comes up a lot for us um, in terms of developing the support material that goes alongside our game. Um, we've really, I mean, we've, we're iterating on it all the time. The first version was less interactive. You know, now we've got an interactive version with videos and things like that. Basically, that's come about by um, working with the teachers who were interested in playing the game and finding out from them about how they wanted to run the lessons and kind of um, folding that information back in so that other teachers can access it. So. I think it's right not to be prescriptive about it. Um, another thing that's come up is that some teachers who are really keen to use it but don't play themselves um, find that um, the students know more about using the games than they do and that, that kind of freaks them out. And so I do think that there's a, a strand to do with helping teachers to be comfortable with um, the fact that when it comes to games, they might well be in a situation where they don't know everything and the students know more than they do and, and how you navigate that from a, yeah, from the classroom management perspective. Great, thank you. Um, just quickly, something image. I think one important sorry. thing is also to uh, to speak to teachers and, and do regular focus group discussions and really learn from them what their needs are and. Um, also, we cannot know, because these, at least ours is a global platform, we cannot know how every single country's um, educational framework uh, works. So just asking them, uh, maybe some, for example, some, some terms might not be, um, might be a bit uh, um, inconsiderate or disrespectful. So also working with them to understand what's the best language to use for gamification terms, or also just in general for, for um, the, the curriculum uh, elements. So it's just having regular conversation with teachers and asking what, what their needs are and how to uh, adapt the content as well. Thank you. And actually that brings me to another question, um, which is, um, have you noticed differences across sort of countries and cultures in the uptake and engagement with, with games? So that might be a good one. For, for you, um, uh, Lorenzo and Lisa, to, Lisa, sorry, to start with. Yeah, of course we, well, we have, uh, I think now uh, on the Ultimate Dialogue Adventure students from uh, around almost 80 countries. So we have a lot of diversity there and we see that students in different countries are um, interested in different things. So there are maybe, uh, well, Mostly, mostly they're all interested in the content of the topics and learning about global issues. Uh, but in terms of um, rewards uh, from the gamification elements, they like different things. So um, maybe there are some that are interested in receiving certificates, for example, after completing a topic or a video conference, or there are others that are interested in receiving personalized um, recommendation to how to increase their their um, skills for example dialogue skills um, so it's again it's important uh, to have uh, regular conversations with them and try to improve the platform uh, both from a content perspective but also from those gamification elements um, and for us a big and important thing where we were developing these gamification elements was also to make sure that it's not they're not addictive so the, it, it makes it fun for students to use the platform, but it, it doesn't become addictive. So that's another important aspect um, that we've tried to, to follow. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you wanna add anything. I would just say one other trend that we can sort of identify in use across different cultures and uh, or different countries and, and regions 
is um, how these games get used, whether they tend to be more self-directed in certain areas. Um, you know, and this also, I think, spans across like government schools and, and public and private schools and whether, you know, how they're used. Are they used more inside of the course curriculum, like in the classroom? Are they used in flipped ways, extracurricular ways, or are they used, um, you know, and just completely, you know, self-guided ways, individual students, because we have a combination of both. And I think that definitely does differ across some of those different contexts. Great, thank you. Um, and and Torkild, would you like to comment on this one as well? Yes, I, I think it, there are diff, there are different um, culture views on, on games, um, and nationally bind, I would say. Um, I'm, especially we look at at the commercial games, very different guidelines, views on the role place of commercial games in education, formal education. In different countries, just you know, compare Denmark and Germany, two countries next to each other, but very, very different in their views upon the role of computer games in formal education. Um, and and I think uh, there's also a question when you're using commercial games in school that are often in English. So as a non-native <laughs> English speaker, um, there's also an issue when you are taking those in, into um, into the classroom, which is, I mean, a, a game that is very popular among uh, Danish as an L1 uh, subject teaches is Limbo. Maybe you know the game Limbo. It's one Nobel's Prize. It's this indie game, very uh, dark uh, game where you are a boy looking for your sister. And, and this game has no text at all. And it's very simple to play. So the teachers like the game because it's very simple to play. There's no text in English. Uh, but the story is very mysterious, very complex. So it's an excellent game for an L1 teacher because it's not English language, it's easy to play, and there's a lot of teaching to do in unpacking what the story might mean. And there's an open ending of the game, which is very rare in video games. So it's an indie game. So, so that game actually fits well into the Danish curriculum in that sense. So, it, but, so, so there are different kinds of cultural considerations when you want to take games into the curriculum, um, just an example. Great, thank you. And Marianne, did you want to um, talk about rolling the game out in various various places? Um, well, I mean, uh, Adventures in English is available globally, um, and we've particularly um, there are certain countries where it's been. Um, particularly popular. Japan was one of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's designed, it's, it's trying to fill that gap where um, you've got first language um, commercial games, um, where perhaps the language level is um, too high for, um, for beginner and elementary um, learners. So um, hopefully it's, it's, okay, it's okay to use anywhere. Great, thank you. Um, now there's a question here, which a question for Torkild. Are there any known negative impacts for using games in education? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe a bad game design can result in boredom. Uh, I don't know. I, ha I have seen examples of that where games are oversold and, and students, I exp they are presented with an educational game and they go into it and I think it's a Grand Theft Auto and they're going to just fool around and um, do uh, crazy stuff within the game and they find out that it's actually a lot of dialogue they have to just clicking on and they get very frustrated and they end up being kicked out of the classroom. So it's, it's kind of, um, I would say, adjusting your expectations with your students about what is going to happen when you bring a game into the classroom, which again goes back to be, we need to be a bit more precise when we talk about games in education. So not overselling um, <laughs> games is, is actually important, I think. But I, I don't think there's any kind of harms, uh, ethical harms done in that way, the games. Boredom is probably the worst. <laughs> 
so that was that was specifically directed to talk and I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in or we can move to the next question um well there was one thing I guess yeah. I wanted to add because um sometimes people talk about violence in video games and whether mm. violence in video games equates to violence in real life and as far as I can tell um the the studies on that don't show a link there but there was an interesting one that I came across and again I'd have to dig out the reference afterwards but um it was talking about um sexualized violence and how they they observed a reduction in empathy towards the victims of sexual abuse after people had played um video games that um featured sexual violence normal violence they didn't see it so if you're like shooting ghosts or zombies or something they didn't they didn't um find the same thing but depictions of sexual violence did um seem to have some problematic um outcomes from an empathy perspective okay that's that's interesting so do you talk about I, I don't know if i'm taking time from lisa but i it's okay <laughs> I, I just I just wanted to say that I think this discussion about um, uh, video games and violence is going on for 40 years and that's not really shown any kind of impact on links between playing violent games and violent behavior. That is not to say that it doesn't have negative impact of playing violent games because it might affect your ethical um, and uh, views upon certain issues and, and kind of your empathy towards others that Marianne was mentioning. But I really do want to stress, I think we should shift this discussion a bit from talking about violence uh, into talking about something I think has actually real negative consequences around games, which is the extremely aggressive business models around games. <laughs> so we need to take as educators to go far more into discussing and educating about um, how a lot of games actually ripping our kids. Uh, Do you mean loot boxes? Uh, so that is a far more, that, not more, but it's a very important topic, I think. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, did you want to? I was not going to add on to the conversation of violence. Our game is quite the contrary <laughs> um, <laughs> to that. Um, but um, I did just want to make mention about this negative impact and, and something that really just came up for me and I thought is worth mentioning is how important it is um, and, and potential negative impact is if the game is not used in a in more of a constructive whole. So the point being is that oftentimes there's an assumption that a game happens in isolation and that students will walk away or learners will walk away with this transferable skill and that's not necessarily the case and I think even with the best games. So I do think it's really important to be intentional about how young people are using gamified educational games or video games. And if we're using them in an educational way, really supporting that learning, that long-term learning. And so that could potentially be missed opportunities and have a negative impact if an educator is taking a game and just assigning it and walking away from it. We really wanna think about what are the transferable skills from, from taking advantage of this engaging gamified experience. So I just wanted to kind of add to that, thanks. Great, that's that's fantastic. Well, we're drawing to the end of our time, um, but um, I think there's probably just time for one final question, which um, which to, to all the panelists, um, when it comes to the sort of research that you drew on in um, games and education, um, are there any specific papers that you would uh, particularly recommend? Um, so Lisa, as you're here, do you, do you want to start any sort of particular research or papers that you found particularly helpful in your journey? Um, well, I think I, I don't have anything in mind, but I did actually make a short resource list of some other things. But I think a couple of things that are just worth mentioning is that, I mean, we did look at other products out there. We did look <laughs> at, you know, for example, like Duolingo and we looked Kahoot. We looked at some of these bigger products to kind of see how they kept it so effective and simple, right? Um, I think that was one thing. Um, 
And another thing that's worth mentioning too, and I think Lorenzo touched on this too, is that we were looking at some of the policy research that was going into gamification. So the five rights is a really great example. You know, how do we ensure that students are having a fair and equitable experience, how it, that it's accessible, and also that it's they're not being exploited in those games. So I think these were all places that we really looked. And I'd be happy after this webinar to curate a short list for you guys of some of the things that that we've looked at, but um, that was the area of focus we were kind of looking into. Great, thank, thank you. And um, Mar Marianne, is there some um, tips you could share? Yeah, there's, there's one that springs to mind immediately, which is um, by Habgood and Ainsworth, I think from 2011, um, where they made a game called uh, Zombie Division, and they made two versions, um, one where the um, gameplay and the learning uh, were integrated and one where they were set where they were separate um, and they found um, that the students who played the integrated version at break time they were talking to each other about maths um, whereas uh, the one where it wasn't integrated and you sort of did some maths questions and then later you killed some zombies at break time they were talking about zombies so um I thought it was a really nice study that showed the importance of marrying your learning objectives with your um, gameplay mechanics. Really nice, thank you. And uh, Torquil, is there anything you'd like to add? Recommendations? Well, I, I think uh, my, my personal favorite is a, is a study by Constance Steinkuhler, where she looks at, at how uh, students that uh, are disengaged and poor uh, performing readers boys mainly, I think it is, uh, scoring very low in reading tests when they are being tested in reading skills in relation to the games they are really interested in. in this case was World of Warcraft. They would be performing many levels higher, actually. So I think <laughs> I think it's, it's really important that educators try to be more curious and interested in all the kinds of expertise and knowledge that students may develop around games and how that can be utilized in education. Uh, I mean, that, at least that's one instructional strategy. And, and I think that we need to take that seriously. Great. Well, that's all we're bringing. We're coming now to the end of our time. So I'd like to thank um, everyone who joined us for the uh, brilliant discussion and chat and particularly to our panelists um, for the excellent presentation and insights. It's been a really inspiring and interesting webinar. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, as, as Barry um, mentioned on the chat, um, we uh, this is a recorded webinar, so you'll be able to find um, the recording on YouTube, um, on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to the DEFI homepage, you should be able to find the link uh, from there. So again, thank you very much everyone for joining us.